to the growing place. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be here and share one of my other passions. Uh, usually we meet, hopefully, out in the perennial retail yard of the Aurora store. Uh, but my other passion is house plants, and I am here to get you comfortable with them so you can enjoy them more, so you know how to take care of them and have success. Uh, so I brought in quite a selection here. All of these plants are from the growing place. The containers are from the growing place. But I'm here to help you with what you have. Hopefully you have some, or maybe you'll be inspired to have more. These house plants are in your home. They're beautifying your home. They are lifting your spirits and they're purifying the air in your home. We really, really need these, especially these days. So uh, first of all, I wanted to talk about uh, soil. We're gonna talk about sun. We're gonna talk about maintenance and watering and drainage, all those things we're going to cover plant by plant. We'll talk about different containers and the varieties of plants that appreciate those containers. Uh, first of all, this is over here. You can see the growing place potting mix. This is what I always use as our own mix. I use it for everything that you see here, whether it is sedum, whether it is philodendron, uh, any of the house plants. I've used it even on orchids, although we're going to have our own orchid mix and own orchid pots this year, but it is a very, very versatile material. I want you to know also, I don't keep my potting soil in the house right now. I've got it in the garage and I have it in a cooler. This is my, my little cooler. And for the small pots, it works perfectly. Uh, my larger pots, my larger containers of the potting soil is in my larger cooler in the garage, and that way it doesn't freeze. So if I'm in the mood to transplant or divide or repot one of my house plants, it's always ready. It's not cold. It's not frozen. So again, the coolers are one of my favorite tools that I use. And when I am working with my plants, sometimes I will lay out newspapers. Sometimes I'll lay out a shower curtain, an old shower curtain that works fine. Uh, but now is when I'm really starting to think about attending to them just a little bit more. Because it's still February, but it's the very end of February. We're not getting quite as much sun. And if you have not seen the growth on your plants through the winter, this is expected. This is normal. Uh, they don't get the amount of sun they need for the full photosynthesis process uh, where they receive the sun and turn it into fuel. They're just standing pat. But by the end of March, we're going to have a lot more sun, and this will stimulate the new growth on the plants. This is the time when I really do divide, when I really do transplant, when I really do start to fertilize the plants, and they will need it. Uh, the potting soil is wonderful, these plants. They root out quickly, but they will need plant food. And you can use slow release. You can use our liquid fertilizer. You can use fish emulsion, but they will need fertilizer to produce the new growth that you want. Uh, so having said that, uh, I want to remind you too, the darker the foliage, the less light it needs. So if you have a room right now where you'd like to put a house plant, but you're thinking there's not quite enough sun, sometimes you might want to use ivy or maybe our philodendron or pothos. Uh, these are plants. Uh, this one is a fun one that we carry. Uh, this is a pothos and it's in a teapot. Now, how fun is that? But guess what? There's no drainage in here. So we're going to talk about drainage as well. Overall, all of these house plants will be very content with bright, indirect sun. That's what they need to have. Uh, some of these could take a little more sun. Some of these like a little less. But generally speaking, bright, indirect sun is just exactly what you need. So that is sun. This is soil. And then we need to talk about drainage. Uh, a lot of the pots will have a nice drainage hole in it. This one has one that you can either close up uh, and remove it, if you will. We've got these gorgeous pots here. I'm just loving these. But if you have a pot that you want to plant in and you don't have drainage, then you need to consider using pea gravel, a couple of inches of that, uh, followed by a little bit of activated charcoal. But you've got to have the drainage. These are not water plants. Now, what I do do 
And this is the one time, the only time I recommend landscape fabric. But if you have a container that has the drainage hole, I use this landscape fabric. I will cut a piece off to put it in the bottom of the pot. And it, it acts uh, for multiple reasons. Okay, one, uh, it keeps the soil and the pebbles from running out. I use this on my outside pots as well because I don't want little critters coming up in the hole and the landscape fabric will do that. So I will use the landscape fabric. I just cut it to, uh, to fit the bottom of the pot and then I put in the gravel. So having said that, I'd like to talk about some of these um, containers as well. Uh, but drainage is important. We've talked about soil a little bit. We've talked about sun a little bit. We need to talk about the other big thing, and that is watering. Consistently, I find that people tend to overwater plants, and that's when we get into trouble. If the leaves are turning yellow, that usually indicates a little bit too much water. If the leaves are turning brown, it means they've not had enough water. So we want to keep them happy. There is no way you can have a schedule to one day water everything. It, they don't need it every day. They don't need it uh, that much. It is kind of a plant by plant. So I consistently group my plants according to their sun needs and their watering needs. And I do the exact same thing outside. So uh, having said that, this is what I use pretty much to water the plants because I like the small spout that I can get right into the pot and uh, and give them the water that they need. I'm not much of a little bit often. I'm more of a drench the plant as it needs water. Now, sometimes we have plants like our beautiful Ming ferns. Okay, this is related to the asparagus fern. They're very fluffy and fun and in a container they really fill it up wonderfully. They're very well behaved and they like a little bit of water but it's so full of its tubers. It's so full of roots that the water just spills right over. In fact, when you see the root ball shrinking from the edge of the pot, you know it's really dry. But uh, in this case, it really needs to be repotted. But having said that, that's okay. But what, here's what I do because the water just rolls right off of it. So about twice a month, I will set it into a bowl, halfway filled with water, and let it sit there for about 20 minutes, and it will absorb right up. Uh, this works very well. And then this goes into a pretty container. We've had these birch pots for a while. Every season we get more and more incredible containers. Um, you know, it's according to what you like, but we have a tremendous selection of these. But this is the way that I do this one. And many of them, I do it that way. They're sitting in the cereal bowl or a salad bowl or according to the size of your plant. Uh, and then they absorb the water through the holes that are in the bottom. And then I put it right back in the pretty pot and it's ready to go. All right, so having said that, now some of us have had house plants for a while and the soil is getting compacted, it's getting dry, and really needs to be repotted. And we, we will talk about that. But sometimes I will take my little chopsticks and I will stick it into the soil, okay, gently. And I make holes in it so that the water will go into the root. That's where they need the water. It's not up here. The, the leaves don't need the water. But we need to have the water get to those roots. And hopefully they're all the way at the bottom. And that's why sometimes I will put these into a container. This happens to be one of the types of Sansevieria we can carry. And uh, these are smaller ones. And this one is so happy. It's already getting new growth. I brought this uh, last season uh, over in our annual apartment is pretty much where the house plants are. But almost anything over there can become a house plant. Bright, indirect light. Okay, very few things like that hot, hot sun because sometimes they'll burn. Uh, anyway, uh, so this one doesn't need to be repotted. But as I said earlier, when you see the soil start shrinking away from the edge of the pot, you know it's dry and it probably needs repotting. When I do repot them, I put them on this old shower curtain or my 
newspaper on the floor and I pull the whole plant out. I remove a lot of that old soil. It's just all you stuff. Okay, we're ready for wonderful new potting soil. In order to divide them, and you really will have better success with divisions rather than cuttings. Uh, you can do it. Uh, we do it here. Uh, we've got the professionals in their own greenhouse doing that, but but you will have better success by pulling the plant out of the pot and ripping it apart. Now, by doing that, you're damaging fewer roots, but sometimes I have to use my serrated knife because it will cut right through evenly, and that's fine. I like a clean cut, and why is that? Because if it is cut, for example, out in the garden, if you're using a shovel or a spade to cut it, now you've got all these irregular edges on the root ball, and those are susceptible to bacteria. So we want clean cuts, clean divisions, and we pull it apart, and then we have our, our new pots ready to go with fresh soil. At my house, I remove all of the soil, I rinse off the roots, and I put it in all fresh potting soil. That's how I do it, because I want to have these things for a long time. Uh, even some of the plants that I purchased um, after a year, you know, they're really ready to have a fresh look. And so that's what I do for them. So anyway, but watering is extremely important. Uh, some of these plants, they, they talk to you. And uh, this happens to be, one, this is one of the easiest plants there is. The Sansevieria, you know, as mother-in-law's time, you know, sometimes they're as tall as, as I'm reaching, okay. Um, Low light is fine. Bright and direct light is fine. They don't care. They don't need a lot of water. But I like kind of a regular pattern. And I probably give this a thorough soaking twice a month. That's just fine. So I'm going to set that over here. Okay. Uh, so uh, I wanted to talk about uh, the philodendron and the pothos again because there's nothing easier. You, you can't kill this stuff. This is really, really easy. So this one is in my teapot. Um, use your imagination when it comes to the containers because that's where the fun is. So this one is in my guest bedroom uh, because that's where friends that come to stay with me when they can. Uh, it just cheers up the room. But look in your garage, look in your basement, look in your parents' home, and then come here because we have incredible containers. But you can do something fun. Uh, it doesn't have to be your old basic. So I'm just going to set that right there. This is a fun one that I did a year ago. So this is, I know it's hard for you to see, but this is another philodendron. Again, bright indirect light. And this is a, a vase that I got at a wedding or something. Somebody sent me flowers. And I have filled it part way up to here with terracotta balls. Now, that you don't have, might not have those, but you can use the pea gravel. You can use marbles. It just makes kind of an attractive, interesting uh, container. All right, up on top of the stones, and then I have preserved moss. And then on top of that, I have the soil with the root ball of the plant. And it really is kind of fun. I don't, I don't know that you can see that. I water this once a month. Okay, that's it. Because the roots are now going all the way to the bottom. And so... You know, when you have um, time to travel or able to travel, you know, these plants that don't need so much fussing are really nice to have. And again, they're beautifying your home and boosting your spirit. All right, so that's the philodendron. Now, we've got some of our favorite varieties. Our best sellers are probably the succulents. Everybody loves the succulents right now, which we're going to talk about. But I want you to see this one. So this is a man gave. We carry these in multiple varieties. I love the agaves. Do you know agaves because they have that sharp needle like point at the end of the leaf? But these are soft. These are the man gaves. They come in solid green, uh, slow growing, don't need a lot of water, just like twice a month, a thorough watering, but they're super, super easy. And uh, so this is called a man gave. Now, this is the one that maybe you saw on the website. And so this is a container that, that I got here. 
And this has a jade plant. You all know what that is. This is the secret. I'm going to tell you the complete secret to success, whether you're house plant gardening or whether you're out in the yard. You've got to plant like varieties together. Things that like the same growing condition are very, very happy together. You cannot put succulents with ferns. You cannot do that. The humid loving plants need their own environment and the succulents have all the water in their leaves and they need to be planted together. And whether you're doing this inside or outside, just quickly for an example, outside, all those things that don't need a lot of water, like the succulents, like the dusty miller, anything gray, those things are loving the sun and water at the same time once in a while. But the humid loving plants, you know, they come from the tropics and they love it warm and humid. And so we're gonna have to keep an eye on those. And those are gonna be in the terrariums which we'll talk about shortly. All right, so I'm going to put the man cave over here. And Donnie, then... Donnie can, I, Donnie, can I ask you a question? Yes. I have a question for you. So the ferns and other things that need more moisture that you don't have in terrariums, how do you provide the humidity they need during when they're okay. in your house? Okay, so... Um, uh, we can we can move over to that and then come back to succulents. That's fine. So I'll we'll put these over here. All right. So um, the humidity uh, depends on the container and the room. So this is a terrarium that I made out of a jar, and this provides its own rain garden in here. This is an example of what a real rain garden looks like. So this is just a little jar that I took. And we carry these two-inch pots of ferns and such. They love the humidity. So this is just a jar I took. And I don't know if you can see it. The jar is upside down. And I put in the little pot down there. And I water this, are you ready, once a season. I'm going to get it closer. Okay. So this is like once a season, if you got me, okay? Because there's water dripping down from the sides. That's what we want. Now, if you have a terrarium, you can have it as a closed cover with a glass bell on it, or you can have an open one like this. This one just got really happy in here, so the cover is off. But I have used these kind of jars for terrariums as well. When they are closed, it provides its own humidity and they don't have to be watered as frequently, uh, just now and again. So when you uh, do a terrarium and you can do them in so many different containers, I mean, I just, I couldn't bring them all today with me, but, but this is an example of a basic terrarium container. And so what do we do? We have, again, the pea gravel because there is no drainage in this container at all. So I've got to have a couple of inches of the pea gravel. Then this is when I really need the activated charcoal, which we carry, of course. Uh, it is something that um, purifies the air in there, keeps it sweet. And so you've got your pea gravel, you've got just a thin layer of the activated charcoal, and then you have enough potting soil that is good enough for the amount of soil, the depth of the pot of the plant you're going to put in there. Uh, almost always, I use at least three plants in a terrarium. This one probably would only hold two. Then again, you have to have room for your fun stuff because I like to put accessories in my terrariums in all my pots. So we've got these cute little frogs. I don't know if you can see that, but wouldn't he be cute in here? But this one has some of my favorite beach rocks. I don't know that you can see that at all. You're just going to have to trust me. You, you all know what rocks are. But I wanted to tell you while I'm thinking about it, about the rocks and the shells, because uh, I've had pets. Uh, we all have pets. And outside, we have things like chipmunks and squirrels. So when some of this stuff is outside, or whether they're inside to protect them from my kitties, um, I need to cover the soil so that uh, they leave them alone. And one way I do it is I cover the whole top of the flower pot with rocks, pretty rocks, of course, 
or sometimes I use seashells. You all know what those are. You've all been to the beach. We all have seashells. And by putting a layer of these on the top of the soil of the plant, I assure you this will deter any critters from getting into that. Okay, I promise. Uh, now, then we have this issue of watering. So how do we water these? Now, as I said, I take this out once a season and I soak it in a bowl and I get it nice and wet and I put it back in here. But this one needs a little more water. So uh, what do I use? Well, I've got a clean turkey baster. And this is not the one I use in cooking. No, this is just for my plants. But I can fill this up with water and then I can go right down in there and get exactly what I'm trying to get. I can do that in here. I can do that with everything. Uh, but the, this is one of my favorite tools. I have lots of favorite tools. Uh, the other problem is sometimes with a terrarium, you need to get down in here and remove uh, leaves that have finished because after all, these are live plants and they do very, very well. But a container like this holds the moisture very, very well. But you cannot use the succulents in the terrariums unless you have an open container because they will not like the humidity. They will they will be upset. They'll be done. Okay. But anything that goes in a terrarium type container, they have to like the same conditions. Very often it's a fern. This is another type of fern that we carry. It's called a staghorn fern. And uh, maybe you think of these as kind of an air plant that doesn't need a lot of soil, but I'm sorry, I like them in dirt. So uh, they are, and I probably water this thoroughly once a week. And uh, usually I can just, because it's got a nice saucer on here, I can just use my watering can to do that. I don't use softened water ever because it's got salt in it. Uh, I use drinking water, or if your tap water is salt-free, that's fine as well. Uh, it's all about the water. But I want to also talk to you about protecting your floor when you're watering these plants. Uh, the terrariums are some of my favorites. They're all my favorites. Okay, so if you have plants, as I do, uh, they all have a saucer to pitch drips, but sometimes, you know, when we're doing this drenching, which I really believe in, I really think you need to water these things and then step away because the roots are way down there and this little bit of drink isn't going to do it. Um, so you can see that I've got this one on an upside down container, which is fine. And then uh, I'm going to show you what I do. I do this on the inside to protect my carpeting or my hardwood floors. I do it on the deck to protect the wood on the deck. But I take, and they can be any size, but these are just some old saucers that I have. Sometimes I will put these on an extra ceramic tile I have from my kitchen floor, my bathroom floor. You need to protect your floor, okay? And then I put this on it, or just like this. This is upside down. This is an upside down terracotta or whatever kind of saucer you've got, or old plates. And then I put one right side up. So, because you can't always move these and bring them into the kitchen to the sink. That's too much work. Nobody has extra time for that. If you want to do it, great. But this is what I use. Then, this would hold a larger plant, but you can do these in any size. Now, the other thing that I use are little saucers, and I use these as feet. So I've got four of them. They're very inexpensive. And so these go upside down. Okay, four of them under here. And that keeps them off the floor. And then you don't have the markings on your surface. And I use them inside and outside as well, because even your deck, uh, you know, we don't want to have water spots on that either. All right, so that's about watering there. Now, just move this. All right, so then we've got these terrariums. And we cannot always get our hand down in there, depending on the size. I've got some very big ones at home. I didn't bring them today. Nope, too big. But nevertheless, I've got to sometimes get in there to uh, turn the soil, to remove 
uh, old leaves or to uh, add more box or whatever. So uh, we do sell some tools here. I don't know if we still have this one, but we do have uh, small tools. So this is one that, that does this. So I can get right down in there and that uh, does the job for me. So I do like that a lot. The other tool I really like are my little pruning scissors. And these will remove finished leaves, uh, dead leaves. They'll clean them. You know, I hate to say it, but I have time now. So every day I walk about and see all my plants. And uh, I was just saying to Becca, that sometimes, you know, it's like yoga. You know, you're bending down, you're reaching up, wherever they are, they're all clustered in groups according to their light and water needs together. But I use my little scissors to remove the old foliage when they're, they're tired, they're brown, they're yellow, they're, they're done because they get old. I mean, that's what happens. They keep getting new growth. And especially in the month of March, you're going to see a lot of new growth. So sometimes we cut off those that aren't so attractive anymore. And so I do that all the time. But this is the tool. Regular scissors, they just open too wide and don't do the job, in my opinion. So I do like to have my pruning scissors. And these are always in my apron when I'm here. Okay, so then I like to accessorize the plants. And we carry all these adorable little mushrooms. I'm just loving these. I have lots of them. And they go in there. Uh, some of the bigger pots instead of rocks, like on this one, you know, I might put a concrete bird in there because I think those are kind of cute. Uh, but I did want to show you some more of the succulents and other things. So anyway, I'm going to put the terrariums over here. Uh, they're awesome. They're easy. Terrariums and succulents. If you decide to go away for a month, I mean, these these are fine. They're just fine. They, they are not needy. But when you have open plants, then you need to tend to them. Uh, while I'm over here, I think I probably should cover orchids a little bit. So this happens to be uh, one of the... Uh, orchids that I've had for quite a while. Uh, I don't remember when. And uh, because it needs just a little bit of attention, and that means in the fall, I usually hold back on the water. I have it in a slightly cooler place. And this stresses it out just enough so that that is why consistently it's going to be here. It's, it's all over that you can get beautiful orchids and they're blooming in the winter. Uh, they come from the tropics. There are orchids on every continent there is, but they consistently need it really humid. Okay, and our homes are not really humid, so we're going to have to help it just a little bit. Having this pot set down into one of my other vases, this helps move the humidity in. And so I take my little to get the water down in there because I don't want the mess. I just don't want the splashing. And for the bigger pots, the other works fine, but I do like this tool a lot. We probably all have that. Uh, anyway, we are going to be carrying a full line of orchid containers this year. Uh, we will have this special mulch mixture that orchids really, really like. But I will tell you that I've had a lot of success with our growing place potting soil, with the orchids, with the terrariums, with the succulents, all of it. Uh, it's, it's just, for me, the best stuff. All right, so now let's go back to the succulents. So these are really the easiest plant there is because they don't like water. All the water is held in their foliage, but still sometimes you need foliage. Uh, they're my favorite plant to really cluster several to do this, what we call plant scaping, because they like the same growing condition. You can do plant scaping with the humid loving plants as well. But it's, this is the whole secret is keeping things that like the same growing condition together. That's it. That's all you really have to know. Uh, and everything needs bright indirect light. So these are all growing place plants. And uh, I've had some for quite a while and others not so much. But um, I'm going to just move a couple of these so that I don't knock anything over. Uh, so here's our man gave. Uh, this is a container that we had last year. Well, and Joni, can I interrupt you? Joni, I got to interrupt you for one question. Yes. Um, Jenny uses a mister on her orchids every few days. Is that good or bad? So misting a plant is always good for the humid loving ones. But here's what you have to be careful of. 
because it's no different than having plants outside in the rain. I don't do it when the hot sun, even when the sun is coming in through your window, because when you have water drops on your foliage, the sun can burn holes in the leaves. Got to be careful. So I would do it first thing in the morning uh, so that the mist um, it can work for the plant, but not necessarily be a problem. Overwatering can be a problem, but misting the humid loving plants, it's, it's great, you know. Uh, no problem, but you just have to be careful because um, when we're watering, this is why we're trying not to water the foliage because uh, you can get holes in the leaves from over uh, moisturizing them. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is, we're back to succulents and this is our uh, flapjack. This is, uh, this is just a small one, but we carry these, of course, over in annuals. This is not a perennial. But I will tell you that I'm such a succulent junkie <laughs> that um, in my containers, I have used both annual and perennial succulents in the same container or on the same wreath. They don't care. You know, they, they like the same thing, except the perennial ones could survive outside in the ground. But in the winter, you know, we're not, we're not doing, we, they can, but I don't mind putting, and now none of these are perennial, but I'm just suggesting with some of the containers, I mean, this wonderful container here, I could actually put one of the perennial chicks and hens, and I'm sure you know what that is, the Semper Vibos, they would be wonderful, they look like, like um, flowers, really, the foliage is so pretty, but you can mix the uh, perennial and the annual succulents in the same container that's fine this one uh i just i couldn't resist this pot um i can't wait to see what we have this year um becca reminded us that we open on the 27th of march and uh, we'll all be here for sure anyway so i i wouldn't mind putting a chicks and hens in here that would be fine loves the sun loves the good drainage same growing conditions they don't care i have had perennial succulents thrive in my house i have some on wreaths that I made last fall. You know how we put the second wreaths on pumpkins and on wreaths, and they're just fine. They're just doing fine. Uh, they don't care as long as you don't overwater them. Uh, and these take the bright indirect sun. Uh, now one that we really love, this is one that everybody, and we used to have all of these that are for sale. Uh, so this is another one of the annual succulents, but look at how pretty is that? Look at the color, it's like blue. Uh, but all of my succulents at my house are all like in a little family in my sunniest corner, which is kind of south and western, but not quite at the window. I've even taken, I have a giant flower pot. I mean, really big. You know, when we, in the fall, when we bring in our very special ceramic containers from outside because you know they're not really happy in our winter our winter gets a little brisk so I have a wonderful ceramic container big and then I bought a glass tabletop to uh, put on it and that is where I have some of these so uh, it, it did multiple things for me it got the pretty pot inside and protected it and then I can have it looking attractive like as an end table or corner tables it's all good uh, so this is another one. I have, Go ahead. I have another question for you. Yes, ma'am. How can you re rehabilitate a succulent that has been overwatered? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have to stop watering it. I mean, for sure. Um, it's so easy to want to care for these wonderful plants, but succulents don't like water. Uh, they do need water, but as I said, only about every three weeks do I fully water these. And then you have to leave it alone. You can't be going over there and, and watering. You can always stick your finger in, and if it goes in more than an inch and it's still dry, then it needs water. When the succulents need water, the leaves get soft. They get pliable, uh, very, very soft, and then you know it needs water. But when they get overwatered, uh, and if, if your plant is sitting in wet, I mean, if it's like mud, I would remove the plant. I would take the plant out and just let it dry out. 
when we are propagating these things, we don't even have these in soil. They're just laying down in a tray. And Or if I were to want to propagate this jade plant, I'd be cutting it with my little scissors and I would lay it out for about three days until it was sealed over, till that cutting was sealed over. But if you've got one, depending on how long it's been sitting in the water, that could be that could be a problem. So I would get it out of there immediately for sure and have it in a sunny, put it on a sunny plate by the window and see if you can just let it dry out. But uh, they don't like to be in too much water. They get really unhappy. So, but they need water, but just not very often. So you just have to be checking for that. Does that help? So, okay. I have another question for you. Okay, go ahead. How do you adjust um, how frequently you water in the summer and winter for the succulents? Well, that's a very good question. Um, these succulents in the house want as much sun as you can give them. But outside, they really prefer a gentler light or they will burn. These are not from Arizona and California in the south. I mean, they're not from there. They will burn and turn red and they will be unhappy. So in this house, they are getting as much sun as you can give them. But outside, you know, they're in my eastern exposure. They're, they're there. So I go back to the watering thing. I keep like varieties of plants together. The succulents are all together. My ferns are all together. The ferns on a hot, you know, last June it was 90 something. I watered those every day. And I personally prefer to water them in the morning so that they're not already collapsed by the end of the day when I get home. They love water. They love a lot of water. They love misting. But these kids over here don't like that. Um, so, you know, again, you have to look at them. If that soil is shrinking, then you know they need water, and I will water them fully. Uh, we try not to water the foliage, but sometimes it just can't be helped. And um, but yeah, you have to. You always have to check uh, with your finger, uh, look at the soil, touch the soil. Uh, but keeping it's the whole thing is keeping like things together. It's too hard to take your hose in the summer and say, okay, I'm going to water this, but not this. I mean, it's really, really hard, and people don't always have time for it. So. Things that like the same container. Clearly, the smaller containers are going to need water more frequently than a big container, for sure. Does that help? Okay. You, Joni, you do different watering practices on your succulents in your house that stay in your house. Like in the summer, do you water them more, even though they're in your house, still just always in your house? Or in the winter, do you water them less? Um, they don't need as much water in the winter because they're not growing. So I'm pretty much watering these kids that you see about every three weeks. But I would say again, those that are in the smaller pots, I might be soaking, drenching like this every couple of weeks. And I will take my this pretty one and I prefer to put a, oops, oh, we have a I think we can't see that, Becca. I don't know if you need to come in here and check. So anyway, this is the way I like to water these. Uh, but the smaller pots need water more frequently than a great big pot. But when I water the succulents, I fully water them. I'll tell you something else. When I plant the succulents in what we call this plantscaping, I put several of them in a container. I want it to look pretty the first day that I plant it, I don't want to wait two months until they start growing together because the succulents grow very slowly. Uh, they root out and they're very happy together. And, you know, we have such an incredible assortment of succulents, but I like to put about five of them in a container, really tight, make it wow. And then they're watered thoroughly and then they just step away from them. But according to the size of the pot, and according to the plant's needs, that's how you have to know to water it. Okay. I have a 
um, an indirect versus direct question about lighting. Like, how would you how would you define direct light versus indirect light? or direct bright light. That's fine. All right, so direct sun is going to be, I mean, these plants are right up a lot. I have a lot of windows at my house, and uh, they are right there on uh, different tables and bookshelves and all kinds of stuff. And they are right there, and they're getting as much sun as I can give them. Bright indirect means that they're back a little bit. So maybe they're on your kitchen table instead of right on the windowsill. That would be bright indirect. Now, when we talked about the philodendrons that don't need a lot of light or the ivy that don't need a lot of light, they can be on top of the bookcase and getting light, but just don't forget to water them. Uh, but they don't need. So that's a lower light situation if that's what you have. Uh, otherwise, bright indirect means step it back a little bit away from the window. All right, so a couple of other things I want to point out to you. Uh, I've got some books uh, that I want to recommend. Uh, one of them is um, A Plant Liver Lover's Guide to Succulents uh, uh, and Sedum. So this is something from our zone, from our area for uh, succulents. And as I said, I can use the outside succulents in my house just as easily uh, but these are about perennial succulents. Uh, this is another one I love. This is by Toba Martin, who I happen to know. And she writes The Unexpected Houseplant. Now, she's very brave. And she's done other things uh, out of the ordinary, which I'll let you uh, look at that. Uh, and I've done, I've done them all. And, um, but you have to follow the rules. They need the right sun. They need the right drainage. They need... Uh, the right water, and they need a very pretty container. I think the container just makes, so this is the unexpected house plan. And I've got another one that you might enjoy. And this is called plant recipe. Okay, and this one, uh, and these are actually planted in the container. Uh, these are recent books. This one, the way it works is it shows you this is the one that's on the cover. Not only does it show you the finished product, but it will also show you the photographs of what is in that container. Whoops. So, uh, and it names them. And almost all of these we have available in our growing season. So uh, I'm loving that book. The other thing uh, I quickly want to say is... Uh, about the terrariums. There are many, many, many books about terrariums. This one is called uh, Miniscapes. Uh, this one is called Decorative Terrariums. It doesn't matter. Uh, they're all good. It's all the same thing. And by the way, you can always call us. There's always somebody here, but certainly when we're open, there's always somebody out in the yard that can help you with having success with your house plants. Again, they lift your spirits. They're filtering your air. Uh, they're looking pretty. Um, I know you're wondering about these purple things. Okay, so I just have to quickly then add, sometimes I just like to take the leaves of the plants and put them in a group of three or five empty wine bottles and put them on my table just to cheer up the room. Uh, plants can really lift your spirits and boy, do we do that now. Uh, anyway, I think I've covered most of what I was going to say, unless somebody has any other questions. I do have another question. Um, can you talk about if the soil has bugs or gnats or fungus gnats? Oh. She was asking if peroxide is a good idea or if there's a solution that you have that is a good idea. Well, uh, we all have to do it our own way, but I'm telling you, I'm not, I don't want the bugs in my house. And so... Uh, white flies can be a problem. Scale can be a problem. There's different kind of mealy bugs that can be a problem. Uh, certain kinds of plants are more susceptible to the bug issues. Um, one of the things I do to avoid the bugs in my house is, again, things that are going to go outside always have the landscape fabric at the bottom so the bugs aren't coming in. Thing is, the flying insects well, that, that stops things like pill bugs, but the flying insects like the white flies and the gnats, you know, they're landed in the soil. Um, 
I don't want them in my house. Okay, so I'm kind of a get rid of them. But honestly, you could try a couple of things. Uh, you could first uh, take a spoon and remove the top, you know, a couple inches of soil because that's where they're laying their eggs. Uh, you could put them in a garbage bag and do the spray. They've got different sprays. But honestly, uh, I, I oppose pesticides. It's not a good thing. Um, certain plants are more susceptible. You just have to be careful. And this is why when you bring them in from outside, uh, you have to really, really clean them and clean the pots uh, so that you're not bringing in things. So if you have them, I mean, there are some gentle uh, soap um what do you call it, Becca? Soap. Um, well, we have the insecticidal soap. Insecticidal neem soap. oil. Yeah, neem oil. Just, just not on the page. Uh, the insecticidal soaps are very good. Uh, sometimes I will put plants in my tub with my shower and wash them off. Uh, sometimes it takes multiple times of doing that, but that seems to work really well for uh, the aphids and the mealybugs, uh, but some of the insecticidal soaps uh, work really, really well, but it may take more than one application. When you get things like scale, which uh, they're like little tiny shells that are on the stems of plants, uh, you have to just cut those off. I mean, you can take uh, alcohol pads or alcohol with a little bit of, of um, uh, like the cotton balls and you know, take them right down uh, the stem of the plant and that will get rid of them too. Uh, that does work. The flying ones are tough. They're really, really tough. And the problem is they say, oh, there's another plant I want to go to. I mean, if you don't get rid of them right away, chances are they're going to move around. So I do tend to isolate them and uh, give it my best shot. And then if that doesn't work, they're leaving. So... Uh, I have a couple more questions in the chat. So Linda has a philodendron that's growing like a vine and is six feet tall on a trellis. How do you maintain it? Should she trim it? Also, it might have spider mites. How would you treat that? Spider mites are a problem. If this is something that she can uh, put somewhere like a bathtub to spray it. Uh, spider mites are bad. Um, bugs are, you know what, 90% of the bugs we have in the garden are good. I mean, let's be clear about that. But in the house, spider mites are not welcome. And they're very tiny and they're very hard to see. And sometimes you'll see them on the underside of the leaf. Okay, so it's really hard to clean them. Uh, I would probably start with uh, hosing them off in my bathtub but uh, they definitely have to be sprayed. If the in, uh, if the if it's too bad, then sometimes I do cut off those branches. If she wants to have that philodendron be six feet tall, and I have some that have kind of wound around my bookcase, but in March that's when I cut them, and I I cut them and I put many of them into bottles like this wine bottle. And they're very, very pretty in different rooms of the house. But what happens then is it stimulates more growth from the root ball. And, and so you will have more branching and more foliage. So it's okay to trim some of these things because it's really tough for that water to get all the way to the end of that six-foot vine. Uh, so I, I do cut mine uh, usually in March. And I don't have to cut it down to this, but I do trim them up because you've got to look at them closely to see. Uh, sometimes they have older leaves on them and they're not as pretty, uh, but with the bugs, you know, you, you've got to hose them off and use the insecticidal soap, but you have to try to catch it early. Okay, and I have a question about um, growing herbs indoors. What kind of soil or compost material or preferably organic would you use? And uh, what what will do best in the house with light requirements? Okay, okay. Um, there are some of the herbs, and we're going to have a whole class on that coming up. I think it's the, the twenty the twentieth of March, I believe. Yes. Okay. But for the moment, uh, herbs need full sun. Full sun is six hours, whether it's inside or outside. They have got to have the sun, and so they are in your brightest window. 
uh, hopefully they're in a container because they will grow. Uh, the more you use them, the more they'll grow new leaves, uh, but they want as much sun as you can get them. Therefore, you better keep an eye on the watering as well. Um, I use this. I keep going back to the Growing Place potting soil. That is what I use for all of my containers, all of my herbs, and it works wonderfully. And herbs uh, do need fertilizer. And yes, there's organic fertilizer, of course, uh, because we're eating these. And uh, all of our herbs are grown here. Uh, no GMOs, they, but they have their own greenhouse. They're never, ever sprayed. You can eat them right off of our tables. Uh, but honestly, uh, probably mint, uh, basil, parsley, chives, maybe lemon verbena are really wonderful for an inside plant. But I think right along your kitchen sill because you want to remember to use them and that will stimulate more growth. Uh, just remember that uh, cooking with herbs, you want to use them, uh, put them in your, uh, whatever you're cooking in the last five minutes to get the most flavor. Okay. Um, does anybody have any other questions? If you want to unmute and ask your questions live, feel free. Um, yeah, any more questions? Well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, this has been recorded, so we will get this up and posted pretty soon. Um, if you wanna share it with anybody or if you wanna go back and watch it again. Um, and again, we are opening on the 27th of March. It's gonna be uh, exciting and fun. And um, I think this year we'll be doing mostly virtual stuff for classes and take home workshops um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, we have a YouTube page. Uh, if you go to our website, Linda asked where these will be posted. So we have a YouTube page. And if you go to our website, thegrowingplace.com, up in the top right corner, there's the little social media icons. And I think the last one is the little YouTube icon. Um, and you can just click there to get it. All right. Oh, I have another question, Joni. I'm ready. Uh, Tina has a money plant that the leaves keep turning brown and falling off. Can, what can she do? My, my question would be how often do you water it? That's it. Uh, as I said earlier, the leaves often turn yellow when they're old or overwatered, but if they're brown, they're not getting substantial water. And uh, like I said, a little um, bit of water often isn't going to do it. You've got to fully water these things, just not too often. But it sounds like a watering problem. And drainage. It's a, a large pot in full sun, and she waters it when it feels dry. <laughs> okay, so you're talking about... Um, Money plant, monkey plant, that's kind of what this is. Uh, so these No, the money plant. Um, the money plant. Not okay. that's the ZZ plant. But this doesn't plant. need to have full hot sun. It's getting too, it's too hot for it there. She needs to back it up a little bit and keep an eye on that watering a little bit more. Uh, I wonder if it even needs repotting. But too much sun can be a bad thing. Uh, yes. Uh, Linda also had a question about repotting a large snake plant. Oh, great. Um, great. <laughs> if she uh, puts it in a pot with drainage, uh, you, can water, you can water it with a bowl on the bottom. If that's fine. Yes, that, that is fine. Uh, they're very slow growing. Uh, they don't need a lot of water. And they like bright indirect light, but if it's an older one, if you've had it for quite a while, it probably needs repotting. And again, in a pot that's about two inches greater in diameter than the pot that it probably came in, okay? Uh, I probably watered my bigger ones maybe every week and a half or so. Uh, not too often, they don't like a lot of water. Joni, I don't water my Sansevieria uh, like until every two weeks, basically. So it just depends on where they are. Every two how weeks, much water they do. yes, how much sun they're getting. Um, and then I thoroughly water them. And I don't mean till they're in standing water. I don't mean till the water's coming out all over. But they do need to have a substantial drink with good water. Yes. 
All right. Well, I'm going to end this. Uh, thank you again for everybody coming. Uh, we will see you next week. We are talking about fruits and berries, growing fruits and berries outside. All right. Have a good Saturday.